Emperors. Warhammer loves its emperors. Or kings, or god kings, or whatever you want to call them. A main figure who's in charge of everyone and rules over their subjects with varying degrees of an iron grip. You've got the Emperor of Mankind, gaslighting generations of people that he isn't a horrible person. You've got the Phoenix Kings of the Elves, wavering back and forth at light speed between being incredible leaders and blisteringly incompetent. And you have Karl Franz, who is the best person ever and perfect in all possible ways. Praise be unto the Prince and Emperor. But in the Age of Sigmar, there's a pretty clear one who should be in charge. The one ruler who should reign above all others over the mortal realms. Nagash, the great necromancer. I'm just gonna come right out and say it, this man should be in charge. Pardon me, this deity should be in charge. Nagash is the end-all be-all of rulership and godliness in Warhammer, and in some ways that can be taken quite literally. I have come to see the light in this setting. It's not the brilliant light of Heish, nor the dazzling starlight of the skies in his ear. It's the purple, menacing light of Shyish. For you see, today I come to you bearing the reasons that Nagash out of all the gods in the Age of Sigmar, be they order, chaos, or destruction, is the true and rightful ruler of the setting. The one that should be worshipped before any other. I have not come to be nice. I have not come to be fair and unbiased. I have come to you today as a missionary to show you all the truth. The truth of the wonders of Nagash. Allow me to explain to you, not propaganda, not justifications, but the cold hard facts. So first off, we're gonna start with the easy stuff. I mean really easy, surface level stuff. His titles. Now I know what you're probably thinking. You're probably thinking that you cannot be about to tell me Nagash deserves to rule solely based off his titles. But hear me out. Titles tell you a lot about someone. They tell you their deeds, what their position is, what they're like. And Nagash's titles say it all. The God of the Dead, the Undying King, the Supreme Lord of Undeath, the Great Necromancer. Nagash's titles aren't just meaningless babble, each and every one of them is fully earned. I mean, let's just look at that last one because it goes the hardest. The Great Necromancer. The dude invented the concept of necromancy in Warhammer. Full stop. Before Nagash, it didn't exist, and that tells you quite a few things. For one, he's damn smart. To invent an entire new school of magic isn't something you do by banging rocks together and hoping for the best. Unless you're the Skaven, but this isn't their video. It also tells you that he's probably pretty powerful. I mean, the word great is right there in the title. He's great at being a necromancer. His titles tell you everything you need to know about him. Of course, we're going to expand on them, but for a nice, easy-to-understand reason as to why he's to be feared and worshipped, look at what he's known by and you'll get it. They're also the coolest titles in Warhammer. The Emperor of Mankind. Wow. That only tells you he's in charge of mankind. You know who else was arguably the Emperor of Mankind at one point? Dieter IV of Stirland. The Emperor of Mankind who reacted to a fat goblin destroying dwarfs by moving the capital of the Empire away from the dwarfs and hiding from the fat goblin. The title of Emperor tells you nothing, but the titles of Supreme Lord of Undeath and the Great Necromancer tell you that Nagash is in charge, he's in charge for a reason, and either way, they just sound cool. But let's delve a bit deeper than the surface level. Let's look at some solid reasons for why you should serve Nagash. You see, what Nagash is, is the God of the Dead. And death is an interesting thing in the Warhammer settings, especially in AOS. There's countless afterlives born of the thoughts and beliefs of the mortal races that all coalesce in the realm of Shyish. And do you happen to know who rules over all of them? Why, it would be none other than Nagash, of course. In fact, that was his very first act in the Age of Sigmar, to absorb the other death gods and become the only death god. When you die, your end result is almost certainly ending up in Shyish. There are some exceptions to this, of course. In Warhammer, there are very few absolutes, chief among them, of course, being the Stormcast Eternals. Sigmar just reforges them a new body when they die, and they're back at it again, a little bit angstier and a whole lot angrier at whatever killed them. But assuming that you are not a Stormcast Eternal, which statistically you are not, it's just a matter of hedging your bets and ensuring you've got a reasonably safe afterlife by worshipping Nagash. That's not to say he won't torture you if you displease him, he very well might, but tell me, if you were to be interrogated by Nagash, or interviewed, or however you want to call it, what would you rather be? A devout follower of Sigmar, or Teclas, or any other gods of the mortal realms, or a part of the Nagash fan club. Death is inevitable, which means Nagash is inevitable, so you might as well be on the safe side and worship him before the issue is forced. But some people may not like that answer, or may think they can get around it. Fine. Whatever. You're stupid, but you do you. How about this for a reason Nagash is right then? Nagash does to some extent reward those who follow him, or will at least keep your eternal soul relatively safe. Safe, of course, meaning that you won't be tortured by demons for all time. As proof, consider who he brought back from the old world. Neferata, Manfred, Arkan, Usharan. 
Those are beings who fell when the world itself was destroyed by chaos, and yet their souls have been returned once more in the Age of Sigmar. Similarly, Undeath and Warhammer is pretty safe from chaos. Yeah, if a vampire gets chopped in half by a chaos warrior's axe, they're screwed, but I mean more on a corruption level. It's incredibly hard to corrupt the undead to chaos. Not impossible, as the Blood Knights who joined Korn in the End Times, or the Osiarch's Fortress at the All Points shows, but it usually requires either the corrupted undead to join willingly, or to be somewhere absolutely inundated with chaos. Chaos. As far as it normally goes, even if a great unclean one blasts a vampire with Nurgle's rot, there's a decent chance they'll make it out just fine. A whole lot smellier, and probably wishing they were fighting someone with a better sense of hygiene, but uncorrupted. With that taken into consideration, Nagash is both the guy who invented Undeath and is exceptionally good at his necromantic skills, given that he's a god of it on top of its creator. If you worship Nagash, he can keep you safe from chaos. Given that he's incredibly possessive over souls, even if you're not that important to him, he's still gonna protect you from being ripped out of his realm by the Dark Gods. And either way, if you're an undead, Nagash automatically has a claim on your soul, so you best play nice even if you don't want to. Chaos fans may be saying, but what about the Age of Chaos? And I concede, Nagash had a bit of a poor showing during that. But compare him to everyone else. The Lumineth were melting down before it even properly began, Sigmar ran away to hide in his man cave for who knows how long, and Ilariel died. The Stormcast had to replant her so she'd come back. The undead lost much like everyone else, but consider that most of what they lost was mindless zombies and skeletons. There's no soul there, just death magic puppeting them like a messed up version of Kermit. With the actual souls, if Nagash wants to keep it, he will. Sure, other gods have equivalents of this, but Nagash has a much more direct grasp on his followers' souls, given the god of the dead thing. The only one I think can truly rival him with this level of possession over souls is Sigmar with his Stormcast, and there's not exactly a lot of Stormcast going around. But speaking of which, let's talk about that. Sigmar is a damned thief. He steals souls from Nagash for his Stormcast. And you know what? The 4th edition trailer proves it. You can see Nagash holding the soul of the woman who becomes a Stormcast, and Sigmar just goes yoink like he's stealing an assassination in Halo Reach. Nagash pretty clearly had her, but nah, Sigmar just waltzes in and steals her soul. Before this, I could accept that to some extent Nagash was just being bitter. That Sigmar brought back Stormcast right before they died, and Nagash was just angry Sigmar kept them from fully dying. But clearly, that's not true. That lady was dead, full stop, and Sigmar stole her soul. Outrageous. She could have been part of one of the finest Osiarch Bone Reapers, but no, Sigmar needed his ground marines. All of the other gods are thieves too, to some degree. Tyrion and Teclis made the souls of the Lumineth and Idaneth and all those other failed races out of elf souls from inside Slaanesh. Given that Slaanesh got those souls from the aftermath of the End Times, they were very much dead. But you know, maybe you can consider AOS a fresh start from that. Those souls don't count as being properly dead anymore because it's a new universe now. Fine, I get that. But Sigmar? Just straight up thievery. And this vindicates his behavior against the forces of order so much, because yeah, I'd probably be angry too if someone came into my room and just started taking all of my stuff. I'd probably press some form of legal charges. But Nagash is a god, so of course the way he retaliates is going to be a bit more extreme. You can't fault him for that. And with how valuable the Stormcast are, it only makes sense that Nagash gets a numerically higher amount of souls in turn. Why yes, I do believe it's entirely valid to turn a whole village into zombies in exchange for a single storm. Stormcast. But with all this thievery, you might have an insidious brain worm creeping in right now, telling you Nagash must be pretty weak. I mean, all these people keep stealing stuff from him. Surely he's a pushover. That brain worm must be silenced, for it is lying to you. Because you know what Nagash has nearly done on three separate occasions? One Warhammer. Uncontested, decisive Nagash victory. Twice in fantasy, and once so far in Age of Sigmar. Now the brain worm might be creeping back up in your skull, saying nearly doesn't count and that he's incapable of doing things. But this is not the case. Nagash has only ever failed because he was stopped. By rather overwhelming force, might I add. The first time in fantasy was a spell that nearly killed everything on the planet and raised them up when the Tomb Kings were still people. This would have killed off all factions, all future factions, and raised them up as his undead puppets. Chaos would have had no more worshippers or sources of power because all their followers are dead, and Nagash would have ruled supreme for all time. The only reason he failed at this was not because the ritual was impossible, not because he wasn't capable of performing it, but because the Skaven and the second greatest Tomb King ever stopped him. The second time was even better, because instead of just killing everyone, he nearly used the Wind of Death to a send to unrivaled godhood. 
His plan was to become chaos itself. And once again, this was not considered an outlandish plan that was impossible. This was not considered something that would fail because he just wasn't good enough to do it. This was something that the chaos gods immediately started panicking and throwing all their followers and demons at, because otherwise this motherfucker was going to become omnipotent. Once again, Nagash got Skaven, this time by them digging under the pyramid and blowing it up with a nuke. But otherwise, he was going to do it. And the third time, of course, was Age of Sigmar, where instead of just killing everyone on one planet, he was going to kill everyone in eight different realities. And while the Skaven did of course once again ruin this, because the Skaven exists solely to ruin Nagash's plans, he nearly did it for a third time. Same deal, he was fully capable of pulling it off, and this time the only reason anyone even found out about it is because wizards of other factions just started getting prophetic visions of what he was doing. Reality itself is so afraid of Nagash that the reason he lost is because it came to people in a dream. And he didn't even completely fail, because he still ended up completely rewriting how the realm of Shyish functions and can enter a magical black hole to supercharge himself temporarily. What do the other gods have that can compare to the rituals he pulls off? Sigmar making the Stormcast? Yeah, as a faction they're powerful, but I don't see any of the Sigmarines casting Power Word Kill on a planet-wide level. Alariel did end up dispelling what he did, but that started the era of the beast and wasn't perfect, and either way, life magic is a hard counter to death magic. She entered Nagash's ritual because she's quite literally literally the one person capable of doing it. That's cheating, I don't care what you have to say about the matter. If I was made out of kryptonite, I could beat Superman in a fist fight. That doesn't speak to my skill. Worshipping Nagash means your patron god is incredibly strong and clever. Strong and clever enough to perform several rituals that could have killed everything ever and ascend to even better godhood than he already has. I don't know about you, but I'd quite like to be on the winning side. And all things considered, that's Team Nagash. Indeed, he may have accidentally caused it so that he now has unlimited power. This one is a bit more shaky since I'm pulling it from a, at time of recording, recently released community post, but humor me for a moment. The community post talks about the basics of how AOS works and the Mortal Realms in particular. It mentions how each of them is a finite area that gets more and more magical as you approach the end of the realm. But this sentence has a little asterisk next to it. An asterisk connected to a note that mentions how ever since Nagash pulled his latest stunt to achieve ultimate power, Shyish now works in reverse of this pattern. Where before afterlives with no living believers would go to the edges and fade away, now those afterlives sink towards the Shyish Nadir and are absorbed. So while information on the specifics is rather limited, it is entirely possible that Shyish is now an endless realm unlike any of the others. Nagash's realm may now be infinite in size, an unlimited realm of death magic and afterlives to rule over, exploit, and draw power from. And even if not, those afterlives all going directly towards the Shyish Nadir now means that Nagash has an unlimited power source anyways. One that comes with the added bonus of him being the only person who can enter it without instantly being deleted from the source code of the universe. The plan went wrong, and in some ways he still has unlimited power. Truly such is the power of Nagash. All of this may be well and good, but how about how he treats his followers? Well, what if I told you he actually treats them fine? Now, before you unload the list of abominable things he's done to people, consider that all of those actions were taken against people who had wronged him in some way. Indeed, I challenge you to find me a single person he's punished who didn't deserve it. For example, the Dreadscythe Herodans. In life, they were healers, and in death, Nagash punishes them for the crime of delaying the deaths of others by turning them into bloodthirsty ghosts trapped in their own bodies watching themselves kill others. This may sound like a slight overreaction, but have you considered that he's a god of the dead? It's in his very nature to dislike healers. I'm not going to begrudge the guy for it. And regardless, the solution to not being turned into one of those things is just to not be a doctor. There are other career paths in life after all, just don't be a medic. Have you considered something like being a poet? Because Nagash doesn't really care about poets either way, and this is a fantasy setting, so poet or bard is an entirely valid career choice. And indeed, with few exceptions, the people that Nagash punishes or, if you want to use bias language, tortures, are generally people that deserve it. And again, he's a god. Can you really fault the guy for having different opinions from us mere mortals on what constitutes a crime? And in some cases, he's quite tolerant. He accepts the presence of necromancers trying to muscle in on his turf after all. Reluctantly, but the end result is they're still allowed to do their thing. And he humors the constant stream of bullshit stemming from the soul by Gravelords at any given moment. Sure, he will eventually say that's too much and put his foot down, but the limit of what too much is is quite generous. Your average Soulblight vampire has probably a dozen different schemes to get his rivals and so-called allies killed in any given moment, and Nagash lets them get away with it. By the age of Sigmar, at least, the only person he regularly punishes with no good reason is Manfred. And Manfred being Manfred is a perfectly good reason to punish him. Indeed, in some ways, he's actually quite benevolent to his forces. Consider the Osiarch. Remember what I mentioned about being a poet? The Osiarch ranks are composed of great warriors, sure, but also craftsmen, musician, and philosophers. And their unlives, while certainly fraught with power, 
peril are not really what I would call bad. Sure, you're an undead, so if you're a fan of things like eating, sleeping, or anything resembling physical comfort, you're probably going to be disappointed, but otherwise it ain't that bad. Every now and then you go take bones from people, fight the army of someone Nagash isn't a big fan of, and otherwise you spend your time garrisoning strongholds and doing whatever hobbies you might have. You can even go down and interact with the living if you want. Sure, they may not like you all that much, but you are in some ways a tax collector. Warrior of Nagash or not, they weren't going to like you to begin with with a career like that. Back to the point though, the OCR do rule over communities of the living. While Nagash's endgame does seem to be to undeadify everyone, the OCR show that might not be necessarily true. Aside from Bone Tax Day, where if you do not have enough bones stored up, they will take yours whether or not you're still using them, they're pretty content to just coexist. Not even coexist a lot of the time, they happily let you do your thing. If you aren't actively attacking or insulting them and are paying their tithes, they simply don't care to bother you. You can live your life doing whatever. I would once again not recommend choosing to be a doctor, but otherwise you're set. They'll even defend you from threats because they need someone to get their bones from. There's a non-zero chance the living would now be allowed to live if Nagash ultimately won. Sure, they'd have to worship Nagash, but aside from that, if the Osiak are anything to go by, then Nagash would let them sit there and exist. And sure, it's been stated several times that Nagash wants to kill everyone ever and bring about an endless era of undeath, but you know, people can change their minds. Who's to say Nagash hasn't had a change of heart for what would happen in the case of his ultimate victory. And if you're about to bring up that during the Age of Chaos many people joined Chaos because Nagash was so horrendous the Dark Gods were seen as a better option, consider this. Nuh uh. And my final piece of evidence as to why Nagash worship is worth your time, why you should without a doubt fall in line in the ranks of his endless legions, is what you as a person get out of worshipping him. First off, everyone gets a shot at an afterlife free of torment for the crime of not worshipping Nagash. Quite the good deal, I'm sure you'll agree. It's also worth noting that the afterlife portions of Shyash, where the living don't reside, can actually be quite nice, since a number of paradisical heavens do exist. Sure, there's statues of Nagash absolutely everywhere, but that's just having consistent theming. And yeah, every now and then, an enemy army such as Chaos will break in and ruin everything, but this is Warhammer. That's just something that happens and you'll have to accept. But as a more active follower of Nagash, you can get quite a few other perks. For example, you can be a vampire. By default, all of them are technically followers of Nagash the moment they become one, even if they're not mostly willing to be a follower of Nagash, and the gig for being a vampire is pretty sweet. The Soulblight Army book lists quite a few ways that vampires don't have the weaknesses a vampire would traditionally be thought to have, so you definitely won't be a pushover. For example, they don't like the sun, but they don't explode if the weather is anything less than a stormy moonless night. And there's nothing saying you can't be happy about worshipping Nagash as a vampire, they're just all very arrogant and don't like the idea of serving someone. So you can become an incredibly powerful super being if you go this route of Nagash worship, but maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you want to go a different route, a route with a much more close-knit relationship with your fellow undead. How about becoming a Bone Reaper? In this case, you are several souls fused together into one unparalleled soldier. You can have a closer relationship than this. You can have any hobby you want, and anyone who picks a fight with you will soon come to find out that the similarities you have to the Stormcast Eternals are not just aesthetic. Sure, if you keep failing, you might end up turned into an OCR horse, but you can earn forgiveness into being a humanoid being once more. Nagash gives you a second chance, see? And even if you just want to be a regular person, Nagash can still work with you. Just be polite and worship him, and those same OCR Bone Reapers will keep you safe. Taxes might be a bit extreme, but this is a Warhammer setting after all. Everything's extreme, and if nothing else, you know for a fact those bones are being put to good use. And besides, no one said the bones you give had to originate from your hometown. Keep your head down, pay the bone man his calcium, and you can land yourself in a decent afterlife in a gaseous center of power. And for the ultimate prize, when your afterlife fades away as they all do in the Age of Sigmar, you can rest easy, knowing that in oblivion, your soul will truly become one with Nagash and the Shyish Nadir. What greater honor could you ask for than to be a part of the perfection that is Nagash? To conclude, Nagash is great. You should worship him. All the people calling him a monster are simply wrong, my former self included. I have come to change my ways, everyone. While I still think elves are great, and in most fantasy settings I'll rally behind whoever has the pointiest ears, in the Age of Sigmar I've changed allegiances. It is death that will rule the day with the cold iron grip of the grave. You too should join me in this. Nagash's time will come. It may come soon, or it may come in untold thousands of years. But after all the champions of the other gods have fought and died, all that will be left will be the undying king to rule over the ruins. And I shall champion his cause until that day finally comes. Or until Tyrion finally gets a model and I'm right back to the Lumineth. Or until I finally start collecting Daughters of Cain, because Marathi is right there. My allegiance is rather fluid. Thank you, as always, to my wonderful channel members. You are the Black Pyramids to my Nagash.
Gash. Without you, my constant stream of garbage just wouldn't be the same. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. You ever sit down to do something and just sit there and continue to sit there? Then sit there some more and continue to fail at what you wanted to do as you go in an endless cycle of being confused, forgetting what you were doing, being unable to concentrate, and just not being able to come up with and finish what you wanted to do? That was me trying to write an end video joke here. Just didn't come to me. Could not figure anything out. I don't know why, just no bells were ringing, nothing was coming together, the mystery box pulled up a china lake. So, uh, here's this. And yet, despite this being 100% undeniably true, it's still the best Souls game.